Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Um, we're so excited that you guys are here today with us. Um, I have a few announcements, actually a lot of announcements, but um, I'll try to be as brief as possible. First of all, the move cards. Um, these are in preparation for our move to the new building. We're asking that everyone fills out one of these move cards. Um, if you haven't got one yet, you can raise your hand. Um, and Tim Stallings will bring you one. Uh, the purpose, this is just to help us update our records as we're transitioning into the new building. Um, there's two parts to the card. Um, the first part you can fill out and you can drop that as you leave today. And the second part we'd like for you to keep. Um, you can put that on your fridge, um, on the mirror where you get ready, or in your car, a place where you can see it and you can think to pray for our church as we go through this transition. Um, next, if you're a guest, we are so excited to have you today. Um, we would love for you to fill out one of the guest cards. You can find that in the back of the chair in front of you. And if you'll just fill that out, we'd love to have a record of your visit. And you can drop that as you leave at the guest services tent. Next, let's talk about the Walk for Life. That will be Saturday, October 10th at Melton Hill Marina. Um, it's at 8.30 in the morning. And Tim Stallings can get you all the information on that. Um, if walking's not your thing, you can come, you can cheer, and then you can always donate. So again, that's Saturday, October 10th at Melton Hill Marina. Um, next, the new building. As most of y'all saw when you drove in, progress is happening. Um, last week, the bathroom structure went up, and this week, the preschool structure will go up. My babies are out there waving. 
Um, next, let's talk about the future services. So drive-in service. Um, people are loving the drive-in service, so we'll continue that for the next couple of months at 9 a.m. Um, inside service, as you all can see, the 1030 service is picking up, gaining traction. So we're going to plan to have another inside service, so just stay tuned for that time. And then life groups. Uh, we're planning to restart the life groups, so just stay tuned, and we'll let you know as soon as we have a date. And last is the most exciting, um, our fall festival. It will be um, Sunday, November 1st, from 4 to 7 at the Museum of Appalachia. And that will be our fall festival. It will be a great time. Um, if you haven't been to the Museum of Appalachia in Clinton, it's a treat, it's beautiful, the grounds are beautiful. Um, so mark that date, uh, whatever you have to do, clear your calendars, uh, Sunday, November 1st, 4 to 7. And that's all the announcements we have. So as the worship team makes their way up to the stage, um, if you all stand up, turn around, um, find five or six people, welcome them. Um, if you introduce yourself, if you're like me, you've been coming three years, still learning new names and new faces. So happy Sunday. We're so happy to have you, and we just hope you have a great service.
Amen. Hopefully you had an opportunity to worship our great God. He is worthy of our worship. And if you don't know him, it is our goal as a church and as a pastor, it's my goal, that you would find an intimate relationship with God through Jesus, his son, who is our only hope of such a relationship with God. If you've got a Bible with you today or a device, I want to invite you to open it up to Daniel 
chapter 2. Uh, we're navigating through this amazing prophetic book written about 2,600 years ago. It is incredible and it's timely. When, if you read this book and you really know what it's saying, what it's talking about, it's as if it was written yesterday. It is applicable to every single person of every age today right here in 2020 in this uh, pandemic world. It's perfect. And so that's what we're looking at. And uh, I, to, to kind of get us to the place in Scripture to begin the uh, chapter 2, I, I want to bring you up to speed. So uh, to put it in context, today in the world there's about 200 sovereign nations. And these nations all have particular boundaries and coordinates and they kind of live by that occasionally regularly in some parts they extend beyond those boundaries and they try to take part they try to annex some other property into their land no different 2600 years ago except for this the person who had the most military power was continually expanding their territory ex continually expanding their boundaries. And so to determine how large your real estate was, if you were the king, it was determined by how powerful your military was. And to determine if you even had a nation, it was determined by your ability to withstand the pressures of a larger, more powerful nation. And so along the, along the way, na uh, the nation of Israel has been under attack. It, it's still under attack. In fact, if you watch the news over the last couple of weeks, there's peace in the Middle East. <laughs> okay. Now, that's really not true. It, it's, it's synthetic peace. They want peace. They say they will do everything possible to generate peace. But I want you to understand something. There will not be peace in the Middle East until Jesus comes up, comes back, and sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem and demands peace as the new king of the world. That's when peace comes to the Middle East. Now, along the way, there's synthetic or partial peace, but Jesus is the one who ultimately will determine that. Now, Israel's been under attack for a long time, and they're still under attack today but there's always a remnant there's always a handful of Jews of Israelis of Hebrews who God leaves in the land and he will always use them to build back and bring back his people now with Nebuchadnezzar it's very common and normal as it is with other great leaders of the world that take over and by the way Nebuchadnezzar was ruthless and wicked and yet he was powerful uh, he was the most, the, the most powerful, wealthiest nation on the planet at that time. And so as it is with other nations, we'll see in the next chapter, his primary goal is not territory expansion. His primary goal is not bragging rights on how many acres his nation is. His goal is to be lauded and praised as God himself. That's what these guys want. They want the world to see them as more than mortal. They want the world to see them as God. And so the title of the message today, because we're going to look in the lives again of these four Hebrew boys, Daniel, Azariah, Mishael, Hananiah. You would know them in their ungodly Babylonian names as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what's going to happen is the whole world seems to be falling in on them. As if it hadn't already, it ain't over yet. And sometimes in our life, we have to just throw up our hands and say, seriously? I mean, have you ever had that happen in your life where you just kind of look around at the way things have flipped upside down and you're like, seriously, why is this happening? If you've ever, if you've ever thought that, say, I have. Good, I thought I might be the only one. So we're all on the same page. We've all had that. So the, the title of the message is seriously. Now look what happens in verse 1. Verse 1 of Daniel chapter 2 says, in the second year of his reign, this is actually the third year of, of his actual reign because they don't count the first year. So he's, he's had power for three years. That means the Hebrew boys that he took out, that he deported from Israel, they have finished their three-year degree in cultural studies and witchcraft. Okay, He's reprogramming them. At the end of his second year, Nebuchadnezzar had many dreams and his mind was disturbed and he suffered from insomnia. Now, uh, what's going on is, is Nebuchadnezzar is a powerful man. And with power and with authority and with success and with dreams and visions comes also like restlessness, insomnia, uh, trouble sleeping. And so when you wake up at any time in the night, it's kind of game over on the sleep. I know that. I've, some of y'all just got up about 20 minutes ago, maybe I can tell by looking, you still sleepy looking, okay? I've been up since 4.15 my life right now is this, 4.15, I wake up, 
4.30, 5, whatever it is, I wake up, and my mind, the gears start turning. I start thinking about church. I start thinking about having another service. I start thinking about the stuff that's going on. I start thinking about the building. And so I just go ahead and get up. And I have found that for me, the greatest time for sermon preparation and prayer and Bible study is about 4 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Because at 9 o'clock, everybody else's gears start turning. All right, So I got about from 4 or 5 to 9 that it's just me and Jesus. And it's a really, really good time. Now, uh, everybody, it says Nebuchadnezzar's struggling with insomnia. He's waking up because he's having these dreams. They're waking him up. Do, do you dream? If you dream, say, I do. Yeah, well, the truth is, everybody dreams. Research shows every single person who is alive dreams. They dream five times per night. Some dr dream in color. Some dream black and white. Some dream uh, based on uh, something they've thought of or seen on the internet before they go to bed. Some because they ate too much chips and salsa at El Matate. You know, there's all these reasons and these things that influence our dreams, but you and I dream. Dreams are what we have at night. Now, there's another thing like that, which is a vision. A vision is what you get um, by the day. Some people say they daydream. You don't really daydream, you day think. A daydream is you're consciously thinking of something and kind of absentee from what's going on around you, but you're still aware. Research says that when you dream, your body almost goes into a state of paralysis. Isn't that crazy? I didn't know that. But that's what they say. And, and dreams can be significant. I shared one I had recently, you know, powerful dream, you know, that I was taking, and it was real. Anybody have a dream? You wake up and it's real? I mean, you know it's real. I woke up one Sunday morning about two months ago. I told Kendra, my wife, I said, uh, we've got to reschedule Juliana's piano appointment. She's like, what are you talking about? I said, I took her up to Norris at the White House on East Norris for her first piano lesson. <laughs> Keep in mind, she, she's two. I took her up there, and I went in. It's a school for special children, bright kids, and she was going to have her first piano lesson, and it was upstairs, but what was weird, to get to the piano, you had to climb a rope ladder. I got her. I carried her up the rope ladder. I got her up there. We were 10 minutes late. The lady said, sorry, you're late. No piano lesson, and then I woke up. It was so real. I can take you to the house and show you the rope ladder that doesn't even exist. That's how real dreams can be, right? Well, this is what the king has had. He's having these crazy dreams that keep him up all night and so he's we're going to find out he's wanting to know what they mean now there's also a thing called visions which happen in the day a vision is something that you can kind of see the future a bit or you feel like you can and, and so visions for a church uh, or for a leader are often intentional directional and purposeful and so for a leader they often get translated into like a vision statement or a mission statement statement as an example for the church at Sturkey Hills this I want you to be familiar with our vision mission statement I want you to know who we are as a church <clears throat> moving forward and this is generated by a vision that God has given me and the leadership for the church I think we've got it up here we got it up here on the screen yeah okay Th this is who we are and we're gonna just saturate your world with this because we want you to know moving forward who we are we exist to lift high the name of Jesus who is the supreme changer of all things number two we exist to unconditionally offer the love of God to all people both here and around the world thirdly we are a community of believers joining together in obedience to the great commandment and a passionate pursuit of the great commission that's that's who we are you say well that's a whole mouthful how do you expect me to learn that because you're smart smarter than you think so we want you to learn that uh, ultimately we'll have them in your hands so you can learn it we want you to know who we are as a church until you get to that place where you memorize this I want to give you four key words of who we are number one knowing we're about knowing Jesus intimately we're about showing the love of Jesus to the world we're about growing as a community of Jesus followers and we are about going next door and around the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ that's who Sturkey Hills is. You take a picture of that right there, Scott. If, I'll give you, put that back up here for him. Scott wants to take a picture. So, yeah. That's right. See, see y'all didn't see that coming. I didn't either. I just noticed a man pointing something at me. I'm glad it wasn't a gun. All right? So that's who we are as a church. And I want us to know, to digest that, 
Because listen to me, as a church, we take the vision of the church corporately and we are supposed to implement it in our life personally. You see, when you leave here on Sunday, you're an ambassador of Jesus and a representative of his church. It's why, it's why I have some friends, I know how they drive. I tell them, do not put Sturkey Hill sticker on the back of your car, okay? Put another church, okay? We are representatives and ambassadors. It's important, so we need to know what we stand for. Now, <clears throat> visions are amazing. I'm not saying God gives everybody visions, but I can say that God has given me visions. Visions that I share that with accuracy... And they unfold and come to fruition fully. The, the, one of the first ones, I've had several, but one of the first ones, we were in Alabama. And God had moved our family to the country. We bought a farm. And uh, I was in bivocational ministry. And he put us in a little church out in the country. And on the first Sunday we visited, a guy got up to sing a solo. And I told my wife, I said, if we end up going here, that guy is going to ask me to work for him. And she said, what are you talking about? You know how your Holy Spirit number two, your wife, that's how she does you sometimes when you have a revelation. They look at you like you've lost your mind. And, I, and, I, and I, maybe I had. And I said, I don't know. It's just what I, that's, I think the Lord just told me that. About two years later, I get a call on a Sunday night. The guy, the little bald-headed man that sang solo, he said, hey, you traveling tomorrow? I said, no. He said, why don't you come by the house? Now, he was a deacon at the church, owned a company. I said, okay. I told Kendra, he's going to offer me that job. She said, Pfft. It could be anything. I said, it could be, but it ain't. So I went up there, drank a cup of coffee. He said, I'd like to make you a partner in my company. And I'm like, okay. All right. It wasn't a few years after that. God gave me a vision. It was time to move to Clinton. That one happened at the Cracker Barrel in uh, Harriman. I'm telling you. I, I pulled the chair out from the table, getting ready to meet another pastor. Pulled the chair out, and the Holy Spirit showed me me moving to Clinton with my family. All right. I thought, man, I, I need me, I need the, what's, what's it called? I need the farmer special. Well, I need some extra bacon because I've got something going on, okay? And ultimately, God opened the door. We ended up in Clinton. Served there for 10 years, and then God showed, God showed me this church. And I drove over here, and it was grown up. You couldn't hardly see the subdivision across the street. And it was, in, it was on hard times, and God showed me, me, pastoring this church. And then we met with them, and the church at Sturkey Hill said, no. And I thought, Brother Mike and I talked about it. I said, they're just not ready. I'm supposed to be there. About eight months later, they called me, or called Second Baptist. We did the revitalization. God sent me over here. God showed me the building that's going up over here. Before the building, those of you that's been here, we put in a road. Why? To make a way for people to get in here to get to the building that we were going to build. I'm telling you, God gives visions. And, 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 and I want to tell you something about a vision. When God gives you a vision, 100% of the time, it will always align itself with the Word of God and the will of God, okay? Always, always. God's vision will never, ever, ever be something for you to do that is not the will of God. It just doesn't work that way. And so it will always align. Now watch what happens in verses 2 through 11 in Daniel 2. It says, so the king issued an order to say, keep in mind he's got insomnia, he's having these bad dreams. He says, the king issued an order to summon the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the wise men in order to explain his dreams to him. So they came and they awaited the king's instructions. And the king told them, I had a dream. And I am anxious to understand the dream. It gets worse. So the wise men replied to the king, and what follows in your Bible is written in Aramaic. There's a language change. It says, O oh, king, live forever. Pause. You see that a lot in the Bible. You see that a lot on movies. O oh, king, live forever. The truth is, O oh, king is going to live forever. And the truth is, O oh, you are going to live forever. You see, everybody lives forever. Some live in heaven, some live in hell. Everybody lives forever someplace, one of two destinations. And Jesus is the crossroads to determine where, where, whether we spend eternity in hell or in heaven. Everybody lives forever. There is no erasing of our existence into oblivion. There is a foreverness for everybody. Tell your person next to you, you're going to be around forever somewhere. Now, <clears throat> he says, king live forever. Tell your servants the dream. And we will disclose the interpretation. The king said, replied to the wise men, my decision is firm. If you do not inform me, listen, of both the dream 
and its interpretation, you will be dismembered and your homes reduced to rubble. Now, this is good. You stand in before a sleepy king. Sleepy people are irritable, right? Your wife, your husband, ever missed their sleep? I got a brand new, Clark, you, you, Clark's irritable because they have a brand new baby. About a week and a half old, I guess. Is he a week and a half? Two and a half weeks old, yeah. And so he stays up all night. It's a good plan. I love it for them. And so you get irritable. Now here we have a king, man. He's sleepy. He's got insomnia. He's got these crazy dreams. And he's mad. And he's wicked and ruthless. He's a bad dude. And so, so he says, listen. You guys say you see stuff. I'm going to see who sees some stuff. I want you to tell me the interpretation of my dream. But before you do that, I want you to tell me my dream. Now, some, some, inter some uh, uh, researchers and commentators say that he forgot his dream. And, and that's in part could be very real. Because, you know, when you wake up a dream, you got parts of it. You don't have the whole story. And, and so maybe he's saying, I want you to not just tell me what it means. I want you to fill in the blanks. I want you to tell me what I dreamed and then tell me what it means. Verse 6, but if you can, oh, and he says, and if you don't, no big deal. I'll just cut you up in pieces and just destroy your home. Okay, no pressure. All right. He says, but if you, can, if you can disclose the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive from me its gifts, a reward, and a considerable honor, so disclose to me the dream and its interpretation. They again replied, let the king inform us of the dream. And they will disclose its information. I'm going to paraphrase the next few verses. What happens is they say, King, there is no human being that can tell you what you dreamed. You, you were asleep when you got it. And we can't even tell you what you're thinking. There are, there's no such thing as a mind reader. If you'll tell us the dream, we can stab at it. But there's no way we can interpret it. Then he goes on he says, for somebody to know your thoughts and your dreams, it's, it's God. And God does not dwell with mortals. God doesn't hang out with us. And, and so no doubt that he's trying to jockey with the king to, 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 to get an audience where he can do what they can do. You remember who, how they were described? Sorcerers, astrologers, diviners, wise men. These are people who, who practiced witchcraft. And so the first one, you know, I can kind of see him saying, you know, King, listen, I, I, I can stab at it because, you know, I got a Ouija board and an eight ball, okay? So I, if you'll just let me come in there, you know, I'll, I'll say a little incantation and I'll move my little Ouija device around the board and it'll tell us some stuff. And if that don't get it, man, I'll shake the eight ball, you know, and look into it and, and I'll get you something. Okay, number two guy steps up and he says, you know, I, I don't mess around with the Ouija board and eight ball. That's foolishness. That's kids, that's kids play. But I can do this. I got a fresh box of fortune cookies. I picked it up down at the Asian Cafe. And I can get you some food. We're going to tell this thing out. So he opens one up and he says, you know, you've made a lot of mistakes, but a friend is on the way. I'm sorry, King, that one's not for you. That's for him. Okay, let me get you another one here. But I do have some good lottery n numbers on the back for you, King. Okay, a a and then the third guy steps up and he's the astrologer. And he's got a fresh newspaper with him, right? And so he says, King, those other guys are clowns. I got it because I look at the stars, man. I look at the stars and I look at birth dates and I look at how things move around in the galaxies. So, King, let me tell you this, okay? You should know, King, that if you're a Leo, Leos are generous people. And they share abundance with loved ones as Jupiter conjuncts Pluto on Thursday, November 12th. Giving will get you far, King Nebuchadnezzar. Lovers realize how much they mean to you and your romantic life will begin to flourish. Throughout this year, you must streamline. It's a historical year of transformation and you don't have any time to waste. And the king is looking at him like, you know, deer in the headlights. He says, okay, you're not a Leo. Okay, let me, maybe you're Aries, king. Let me tell you, your ruling planet Mars goes retrograde this year, king. Will you surrender or go to battle? Welcome to the roaring year that we're in. Get ready for a year of massive change and transformation. Not only can you handle it, you're ready to use the fire sign magic to unlock your dreams. Hey, he just read the Zodiac. That's real. I didn't make that up. I can't even write something that stupid. Okay, And we live in a world just like Nebuchadnezzar who wants to do whatever we can to learn something, to know something about the future. I, know, I can tell you about the future. Listen, here's your future. If you're a child of God adopted into his kingdom through Jesus' his son, you've got a bright future and an eternity in heaven. If you're not, it ain't good. That's the future.
okay? And yet this king was willing to do whatever it takes to, uh, to know what the future holds. So here's the question. Here's these four Hebrew boys who've been, who have, let me pause. I, I went to the doctor. Anybody had a bad week? Anybody had a bad week? So I have. Just me. Okay, that's cool. I'll do it all by myself. Okay, I don't know what's going on, but from here down, hurts. My toes tingle. Feels like they got needles in them. You know, like when your wake, mouth's waking up or if your hand, you fall asleep, your hand's been in the arm bar all night, you know, and you drag it out and then it starts coming awake. You know, it's got needles in it. I got them in my toes right now, okay? My ankles hurt, balls of my feet hurt, my shins hurt, my calves hurt, my knees hurt, my thighs, and that's where the hurt stops. I feel good all the way up from there. So I went to the doctor, get some blood work, and he says, he says, so your legs are hurting? He says, you know, how bad is it? I said, well, it ain't bad. It really ain't that bad. I'm here because Kendra told me to come down here, okay? Because I'm preaching through Daniel, and if you want bad, four Hebrew boys walked a thousand miles at sword point to make an appointment so they could be castrated, so they could go into college to be educated on cultural studies and get a new name that made fun of their God. My life is good. All right? And, and so, but do you ever feel like sometimes, man, you're just kind of, the, the stuff is lined up, and it's like one day seems to turn into a season where things are not what you expected, things are not what you really hoped for, things are not working out like you thought, and you just really want to throw your hands up maybe to God or whoever and just say, seriously? Seriously? Well, for Daniel and his friends, it gets worse. The game's not over yet. What they've already experienced it's just the beginning. And here are some guys who marched for God in integrity. When it came down to def choosing to, whether to defile themselves with the king's food or not in chapter 1, they said, listen, we're not going to take the king's food. It will defile us, and we cannot do anything that will, that will place us at odds with our God. And, and so they're trying. They're trying to live right, and yet everything gets upside down. And so... so they're standing before this king, and he's bad. And I want you to know today, I want to encourage you, okay? If you don't have big problems now, maybe you just came out of them. If you didn't, maybe you're just going into them. But big problems are a part of our life. Point number one, big problems. Watch what happens. You think it's bad for them. Listen what happens in verse 12 and 13. And it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair but sometimes, well, always, God doesn't have to be fair. But listen, in the end, he'll be right and just. Fair, God doesn't play fair. God plays right and just. Fair is we're all annihilated because of our sinful condition. That's fair. Right and just is God loving us so much that he came here and died on a cross for our sin. That's right and just. Now watch what happens. It says in verse 12, because of this, the king got furiously angry. They said, man, we can't do this, man. We, there's nobody's got this game. He says he got furiously angry and gave orders now to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Well, so far so good. So a decree went out and the wise men were about to be executed. And they also sought Daniel and his friends so that they could be executed also. They haven't even done anything wrong. They haven't even been before the king. And yet they've got these big, big problems. So here's the thing. Have you ever said, or has somebody ever asked you, why do bad things happen to good people? You ever heard that? Say, I have. Have you ever said that? Say, I have. Yeah, confession's good for the soul. All right? The truth is, let me just boil that down. You boil it all down, it's not even a good question. Because the Bible says there's none good no, not one. None righteous, no, not one. So, we're, so why do bad things happen to good people? Jesus is the only good people, and bad, really bad things happen to him. Other than that, there's no good people to even ask the question. But why do, does it seem like sometimes we look around and people who are wicked, man, they don't care about God, unchurched, live like hell every day, and yet their life seems pretty good. And meanwhile, I'm over here trying to do right, trying to raise my little family over here. And it's I'm getting bombarded with stuff. I want you to understand something. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, So that you may be like your Father in heaven, since he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
Scripture says that God reigns grace and mercy and love and just plain old reign. He reigns on a lost man's garden just like he reigns on a saved man's garden. He, he loves and provides fresh air to breathe for the good and the bad just alike. Now listen, we said since the beginning of Lucifer's fall from heaven and ultimately became Satan in the Garden of Beginnings, we learned <clears throat> that he is always the direct opposite of of God. He can't create, he can't fabricate, but he can imitate. He can he can copy, he can counterfeit. And so when God says Matthew 5:45 that God reigns on the just and the unjust, then Satan says, and I'm going to release my hellish agenda on good people and bad people. So if you're a Christian in God's eyes, you're good people. Not because you're good, but because Jesus is perfect, he's good, he lives in you. And, and Satan, he puts his, his agenda on you, and he puts his agenda on lost people too. Now, let's put ourselves in these Hebrew boys' shoes for just a minute, okay? 17, 18 years old now. They got there when they were about 15. They have lived, went to school for three years. Now they're 17, 18 years old. And their whole life is coming unglued before them. The king has just said, just kill them. If anybody had a reason to say, seriously, it would be these four boys. And so they're going to be executed because of nothing that they did. And, and, and you know, we live in a world that, that comes up with all kinds of philosophies and ideas about how to respond when things don't seem to be fair, right? You can, you can turn on the news and come up with a dozen ideas, and I'm not even going to go there. Is that what these guys did? Is that, what's, is that what the child of God is supposed to do when we have problems in our life? Listen to me. Big problems are as real as we are in this building. Just, for, just pinch yourself. You're here. You're alive. And big problems come with the fact that you're alive. But listen to me. Big problems can become big possibilities when we know a really big God. I will say it again. Big problems can become big possibilities when we know a really big God. Okay? Watch what happens. This is so cool. They could crash right here, cash in their chips, be murdered, and go on to heaven because God, they were children of God. They could protest and riot and do whatever they wanted to do. That's not what they did. I want you to see. Watch this in verse 14. So then Daniel spoke with prudence, he, a prudent counsel to Arioch, who was in charge of the king's executioners. Here's a boy, 17, 18 years old, looking at the most powerful man in the world's henchman, his hit man, the one who's going to put him on the chopping block, and he just speaks to him with prudence. Now what 18-year-old is ready to do that in today's culture? Few. So he's in charge of the executioners. and He had gone out to execute the wise men of Babylon. And so Daniel inquired of Arioch, the king's deputy, why is the decree from the king so urgent? And, and, and then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and he requested, here it is, requested the king to grant him some time that he might disclose the interpretation to the king. Now, here's what happens. You remember I said in point number two or three of, of, of Daniel chapter one that we need to be respectful. He's still being respectful, man. He's standing before the guy who came to chop him up in little pieces and destroy his home. And he says, would you grant me some time? Would you get me an audience with the king? Now keep in mind, he knows he's going to get an audience with the king. He, all he has to do is say, hey, Arioch, I need you to go do something for me before you, before you chop my head off. Do me one thing. Go see King Nebuchadnezzar and tell him the magic bean kid needs to have an audience with him for just a minute. Okay. And, 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 and he would know, because he would know Daniel is the one that said, I don't want all the meat and potatoes that you're bringing down the pipe that's been sacrificed to ungodly, to lowercase g gods. I don't want your wine. I want water and my bean diet, okay? And, and he turns out ten times better than the rest of them. So he knows Daniel, because Daniel has already been living differently Daniel has already revealed himself as someone who has the hand of a true and living God upon his life. And listen to me, church. 
until we live lives as individuals that reveal the fact that there is a God and the God who created the sun, moon, and stars, that same God has his hand on us and he lives in us and it, it, it begins to just ooze out of us because he's inside of us. We won't have any credibility with the world either. But when we live like Daniel, all of a sudden you can get an audience with the king. I want you to understand something, that our, that our desire to live well for Jesus today affects our ability to live well for Jesus tomorrow. I'm going to say it again. It's powerfully important. Our desire to live well for Jesus today will affect and determine our ability to live well for Jesus tomorrow. Young people, man, I, I remember the days when I thought, man, if I get older, I'm going to get out of this funk, man, where it's just the, the devil's everywhere. You know, it's just, I mean, you're a guy and it's just women, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're just, you know, they're, you know, you know what it is, Harrison, when the women just all over you all the time, you can't do a thing in the world about it, you know, that Courtney, you, you, you run, but you can't hide, man, they just haunt you, okay? And, 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 and meanwhile, the girls are saying, man, the, the guys, I went out on a date, you know, and, uh, and, man, they, they wouldn't keep their hands off of me. I, I'm either going to have to get married or be a nun. You know, something's got to give. You know, or, or, or maybe you're, you're in school and everybody's drinking or smoking weed or messing around with junk or whatever. And, and it's just like, listen, I want to tell you something, young people. It never stops because the enemy is not dead. Okay? It'll stop when Jesus returns. Okay? So you must well now go ahead, drive a stake, plant your feet, put both feet, feet, there you go, that's plural, okay? Put both feet on the same side of the proverbial fence, okay? And make a stand who you are or who you are not. And if you're a child of God, plant your feet on the same side of the fence, on God's side of the fence. And if not, Joshua said, choose you this day who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. If it ain't you, jump over here and live for the devil because he's winning your battles. He's winning, his, he's winning the battles in your life when you jump back and forth. And, and so when we have big problems, they can become big possibilities if we know a big, big God. But here's the thing. How do we move a problem to become a possibility? How do, how do we live? How do we respond? How do we act? How do we get in the middle of that thing so that a problem becomes a possibility? Number three, and we're done. Big problems become big possibilities when we issue big prayers. This is good, powerfully good. Okay, now watch this. I didn't make this up. This is God's narrative. This is Daniel, okay? Big prayers. He just... He said, give me some time with the king. Tell him Bean Boy wants an audience with him. And I'm going to go back to my dorm with my, with my three boys, okay? And, and, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to go back and come up with a, a game plan. Watch their game plan. Verse 17. This is what you do. This is what, this is what we do. He says, then Daniel went to his home and he informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the whole matter. And he asked them to pray for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends would, be, would not be destroyed along with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then in a night vision, <laughs> go figure, they prayed and God answered. How about that? It says, then in a night vision, the mystery was revealed to Daniel, so Daniel praised the God of heaven. That's how we move something from a problem to a possibility. We pray. We pray. It, it's not a last resort. It's a first response. Now, how many of us are like your pastor? Sometimes it's last resort. I got this. I mean, I'm a self-sufficient individual. That's why I hurt from my waist down, okay? I went, I, I, my dad passed away a few weeks ago, and I'm putting a garage door in my mom's basement so she can park inside, and she had some old TVs in her basement. You know, the old TVs, they're as thick as they are wide. And one of them was like a 36-inch TV. Why somebody ever made that, I do not know. And why somebody bought it, I don't know. And so I started picking it up, and my mom said, you shouldn't pick that up. Said, you're going to hurt yourself. I got this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, that contributes to the whole leg numb needles in the feet thing. Okay? I'm self-sufficient. And so when it comes to my prayer life, often I, I don't want to, 
I don't want to burden God with the little stuff. I, what I can handle, I need to handle. Does anybody else feel that way sometimes? I'll handle what I can handle, and if I can't handle it, God will do it. If you think that way sometimes, say amen. Okay, good. Thought I was alone again. All right. It's real. We do that. Listen, prayer is not a last resort. Prayer is supposed to be a first response. Daniel goes home. He says, hey, fellas, we're in this thing together, man. We walked a thousand miles together. We went to see the doctor together. We went to school together. We got y'all got these stupid names, you know, re rebelling against God. We're in this thing together. Now he's going to kill us. We live, die, or whatever. We going to win this thing together. Fair enough. Listen, that's what the church is supposed to be. Just like he went back to his, you know, what he did. He went back to his youth group. And he said, "Hey guys, I'm in the middle of something here. We all pray. Can we pray this thing through together?" He went to his college group and he said, hey, let's come together and pray about this situation. He went home to his family and said, hey, let's pray about this and find out what God wants us to do. He went to his small group, to his Sunday school class. He went to his church and said, church, I got a problem and I want God to make it a possibility. Will you join me in prayer? Why? Because we are on the same page. You know the same God I know. He listens to you just like he listens to me. So if we just make a lot of noise, let's be the squeaky wheel in the room and get God's attention attention and see what he will do and in the end he'll still be sovereign whatever he decides it'll all be fine prayer though to get to that place you can't wait till you're in a crisis to learn how to pray prayer has to be practiced it has to be diligent in our life it says in first thessalonians 5 always rejoice always well wait a minute i just got diagnosed with a with a disease rejoice hey I just lost my job rejoice hey I just you name the problem always rejoice then he goes on he doesn't stop there he says and constantly pray your translation may say pray without ceasing it means to be in a spirit of communion and relationship with God all the time so he can reveal and tell you things and speak to you and he doesn't stop there he says in everything give thanks well that ain't no fun I like giving thanks in the good stuff. In everything, give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, what, that, what does that even mean? What does that even mean? It, it means our prayer should be part of our life as individuals. If you've got a spouse or a family or children, it should be actively integrated into your daily living. Just uh, this past week, uh, my son-in-law Max had a birthday. So our family went to Texas Roadhouse, and it's funny, I've learned this, the whole family shows up if I buy. It's funny how that works. You ever want to know how to keep the family together? Pay for it, okay? And I'm fine with that. I love it. I love the Lord allows me to do that. So we're at, we're at Roadhouse, and they brought our food out there, and Judson, who's my five-year-old grandson, was sitting on my left. I said, hey, buddy, you want to pray? Yeah. So he prayed, you know, thank you for this food and our and our drink, and for uh, Papo, and for everybody, you know, like that. He said, amen. And I was getting ready to eat. He said, hey, Papa, now you pray too. <laughs> well, okay. If he asked me, you know what I do? I pray, you know. If he'd have said, Papa, stand on your head while you pray. I stood on my head and prayed. Oh, that's what you do. All right? Now, here's the thing. It's a picture of what, they're, of what Daniel and his, and his buddies are doing. They're in this thing together, and he's seeing that. We're here together. You ask me to pray. I ask you to pray. We're going to pray. It's beautiful. That's what it should be like with your, with your spouse, with your children, with your family, with your church, with your community. That's what it should look like. We're in this thing together. Now, I was thinking about that verse in 1 Thessalonians, and here's some words I want to show you. First is the expectation. We've got to be people who pray with expectation. We've got to be people who pray with consistency. We've got to be, be people who pray with gratitude. And lastly, we've got to be people who pray in obedience. God hears those prayers. God answers those prayers. God reveals his will for us. And we get marching orders of how to live tomorrow in the middle of a problem as God turns it into a possibility in our life. So why pray? Because it's a game changer. It is a really big deal. James 5, 16 says this. This is the prayer of a righteous person has great effectiveness your bible may say the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much okay listen praying and, and listen righteous person we're not righteous because we're good 
We're righteous because His goodness, Jesus' goodness, has been lavished on us. You see, the heaven perspective of you from God when you get saved is righteous. He sees you as a saint. You don't see it when you look in the mirror because you ain't looking from God's perspective. When He sees you, He sees you through the shed blood and the resurrection of Jesus' His Son. And that's why that's the only way you have righteousness. So it's saying, as a child of God, adopted into the kingdom through Jesus, you pray... And it avails so, and it avails much. Things happen when we pray. And so today, we're finished with this. We live in a world that's got a bunch of problems. Absolutely. We live in homes, many of them, who are saturated with problems. We as individuals often have a lot of problems. I want you to know from the authority of Scripture, that when we take our problems and we see them as possibilities and we saturate them with prayer to a big, big God, things happen. And that's what I want our church to be. I want you to begin to pray for yourself. It's okay to have a selfish prayer. Just every now and then throw in some others, okay? Pray for your family, for those around you. Pray for this church. This church, I truly believe God wants us to be a beacon on a hill. And the beacon, the light shines brightest on the darkest days. So what does it look like when you, when you begin to look at problems as possibilities? Perfect example hit the news this week out in California. Somebody who I've read after, listened after, hundreds and hundreds of hours. His name's John MacArthur. When I go through a book like this, typically his book, his, his commentary is laying open on my desk. Brilliant man has conducted himself with grace for years. Preaching in California, did several weeks online. He didn't tell people we're coming back in. People just said, I'm sick of watching it on a computer. I'm going to church. And so they just started coming to church. Thousands now are coming to church. They had to set up a tent outside. They're shoulder to shoulder, seat to seat. They're coming to church in California. That's not good. So the governor says this. John MacArthur, he was on the uh, Ingram angle. This is what he said. He said, we received a letter with the threat that we could be fined or I could go to jail for a maximum of six months. But my biblical hero, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Apostle Paul. And when Paul went into a town... He didn't ask what the hotel was like. He asked what the jail was like because he knew that's where he was going to spend the night. So I, didn't mind, I don't mind being a little apostolic. In fact, if they want to tuck me into a jail, I'm open for a jail ministry. He says, I've done a lot of other ministries and I haven't had the opportunity to do that one. So bring it on. He says, the church preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died and rose again. And that he's the only source of eternal salvation. The church doesn't exist to make sure it navigates around politicians' whims. The church exists in a world to preach the saving gospel of Christ. We're not concerned about the flu. We're concerned about eternity and eternal life and salvation. And the more dire the circumstances become in the world around us, the more critical, the more essential the church becomes and the more important the gospel becomes. That's how you turn a problem into a possibility. Amen? Now, on a more personal note, why, do we, why is it so important that we pray? Why is it important that we as a church, man, embrace each other, lift up each other, pray for each other? Because it changes things. I got this card this morning. It says, to our church family. It says, we want to thank the church for the calls made, the cards sent, and especially the prayers that went up for Claude. This is from Claude and Claire Lane. They were certainly felt. It says, we hope, we look forward to getting back to church probably next Sunday, Claude and Clara. Claude's in his mid-80s, had a serious heart issue in his, his upper 80s. Went in and worked on a, a, a man's heart in his upper 80s. And he's home now, hoping to come to church. Problems become possibilities when we pray to a big, big God. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe you're here today and uh, all this seems a little foreign to you. It's not foreign to God. 
and you're not foreign to God. He cre created you with a purpose and a plan, and he loves you more than you possibly know. He loves you so much that he came here to rescue you, and it just so happened it looked like a bloody cross on a hill called Calvary. And he, if you don't know him, he wants you to know him. And he's reaching from heaven through the Holy Spirit, whispering to your heart, I love you right where you are, but I love you too much to leave you there. And he wants you to know that if you'll simply confess your sins and repent of those and invite Jesus, the one who died for your sins, to come into your life, he'll save you forevermore. He'll send you on a journey that's more amazing than anything you can imagine, let alone walk in. If you're here today and you need to do that, you just pray to God as the Holy Spirit helps you. And for the rest of us who have already received Jesus into our life, we're all going to face problems, but they can all become possibilities. It's time that we pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your amazing word. Thank you for Daniel and his friends living right in a wrong world. Thank you, God, that truths from 2,600 years ago are still 100% true and applicable for today. We give you praise and glory for that. Thank you for choosing to love the unlovable. That's me. That's us. And thank you for doing something about it. Help us now as we sing this final song to worship you for just a minute, to empower us to live for you in the coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's stand.